never done weight pulling myself, but a lot of people that have gotten dogs from me did weight pull. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a dog called Judge Judy that uh, I gave her to the guy that owned Mufasa. She was a Mufasa daughter. And uh, he ended up getting divorced, and he gave her to this other guy. He was a young kid at the time, and he lived in Michigan and went to all the UKC weight poles, snow pole, sled pole, wheels. And I think she set all these records back then. And uh, But I don't really, I don't know. I tried doing uh, weight pull. I just bores me to death. Mm-hmm. So I've done low-level bike work and stuff. Uh, I've done Iron Dog. I had a dog, Joe. Uh, I had his sister, and I, I sold her to some people in St. Louis, and they got into uh, doing bike work uh, here at the Tom Rose School. I used to go there all the time just doing a little bit of training and, and sport bike work type stuff, uh, drive building, you know, it just, it's fun. It's fun for the dogs. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's, I, I enjoy that. And uh, they took a dog that came from me called Shug. And so I, I knew that the head trainer there, they have a school where they train trainers. They come in from all over the world to you know, get certified on everything from bomb detection to police dog work and stuff. My friend Jake ran the whole thing, and uh, uh, he had gotten American Bulldogs from different people, and he just was pretty much shut off to the breed. He thought he didn't think they were you – know, he's a Malinois guy, so yeah. he didn't think they were anything you do want to work in sport. And so then Shug started working there, and he called me, and he said, dude – this dog should, man. She's got, uh, she got prey drive like a Malinois. I'm like, yeah, I have her crazy brother. I got her brother from the guy that owned the female. He had a female for me and read it to my dog, Jack. This would produce those dogs. And, um, uh, when my dog Joe turned, I guess, four or five months old, he called up and said, do you want this dog? He's got a long nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely want him. Uh, you know, back then, uh, a long nose was two, two, in, two and a half inches <laughs> on a, you know, 80 pound dog, 85, 90 pound dog. Well, I got him and he had been no socialization, nothing, didn't know what a leash was, nothing. And he was a little uh, obnoxious. He wasn't trained, you know, to have banners or anything. So he'd knock you over or pull you down or whatever. So I, I would keep him in a big yard uh, quite a bit and I wasn't doing as much with him as I should have. Well, uh, Suge was doing so good that my friend's like, well, you had to bring that dog to class. So there was an Iron Dog event that they were going to let people uh, with Iron Dog to compete in Iron Dog. You have to pass this thing called the GDT, Guard Dog uh, Training, I guess. I I don't know what it stands for, but uh, it's basically just like a very, very loose obedience thing and the dog has to bite a sleeve and then then you got to get the dog to out which is you know if you don't have a dog training it's hard to get him to just out Mm -hmm. so anyway took joe up there and uh i was joking with them because usually with a dog you never just put him on a sleeve because you don't want him to bite with the tip of their mouth or front teeth you want him to do a full mouth bite so joe was so keyed up uh watching all this stuff go on that he said well go let him go let's see what he does so i let him go and i mean he just ran full mouth fight opened his mouth as wide as would go and just swallowed the sleeve <laughs> and he just loved it he wasn't pissed off at anybody like he loved the decoy but that was a game he liked to play like a a, a rough boy would want to wrestle or yeah. you know box there's no hard feelings he just likes to do that well he he just did that within Two more sessions. Uh, then we had that iron that iron dog trial where you didn't you could compete without the GDT just for fun. It didn't count. And man, we competed and he won. I even got him to do hang time, which I never I never you know, even tried to do hang time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> One of my friends helped me with that, and I, I don't know he he hung for three minutes, which is the requirement. And I never did weight pull with him, so. They have weight pull where you just pull a sled on the grass, and uh, you can even pull an empty sled. You just got to get the dog to pull. Mm-hmm. They have to compete. If it's an Iron Dog 3, they compete three events, which is a sprint race, 
a hardest hitting, which the dog runs and jumps and bites the sleeve and hits the guy as hard as he can. And uh, then the weight pull. And then if it's an iron dog five, you have a tug of war against another dog and uh, hang time. And they got to hang for three minutes. If they don't complete any of those things, then they, they can't title. So anyway, Joe won that. And then they were going to have the iron dog nationals. Uh, or maybe there was one other iron dog before that. And we went and got our GDT. Mm-hmm. Somehow, <laughs> somehow he, he, uh, had it out for me and listened to me. Mm. And so we got our GDT. Like I said, it's just, it's not really strict obedience, mm-hmm. but so we got it. So now we could compete and we, we competed at another iron dog and won that. And then they had the nationals here in St. Louis and he competed against Malawas, pit bulls, band dogs, uh, standard American bulldogs. And he beat everybody. Uh, wow. He won uh, iron dog nationals. It was iron dog five. So he, he's what I'd call a point and shoot bulldog. You know, it didn't take really any training to get him to do that uh-huh. stuff. It's kind of naturally, we started doing like hardest hitting contests with him, which is just everybody lines up their dog and they run sprint, I don't know, 20 yards and slam the decoy. And then the decoy tells them which dog hit the hardest. But he, he's probably won about seven of those. And um, uh, he was a great dog. He was crazy muscled. Like I said, he'd love, he would be perfect around a kid. He never wanted to hurt anybody. He just loved to play that game Mm -hmm. really rough. And people see a dog biting a sleeve and growling and smashing into a decoy. And they think, oh, that dog's mean. But like I said, it's, it's like a a fun, it's just a fun thing for them to do. And they Mm -hmm. don't equate that as being mad or violent. You know, Mm -hmm. I did it with my dog, uh, Clyde. Clyde's about eight years old now, so uh, he's older, but he was really, really good at it, too. And uh, some of it I have to credit with him was my friend Jake took him as a puppy Mm -hmm. from like seven weeks to, uh, I think, about four months. And so he's real serious about that stuff, and that's what he does for a living. So uh, four or five times a day, every day, they do what they call they back tie the dog as a puppy, and they do what they call rag work. So they... They play a game with them where they're going to bite the rag and then they get them to bite a little tug and then a sleeve. Uh, but it's kind of imprinted in their brain is this is fun. And so to this day, my dog Clyde, even at eight years old, if, if I took him somewhere, he'd slam the guy with the sleeve. Maybe not as well as he did when he was young, but he loves it. And he, he's just a prey monster, just crazy. And he, like I said, he doesn't have any malice towards people. Mm-hmm. If he hurt somebody, it was just because he was playing hard. It, it, he wasn't really wanting to hurt anybody. Like mm-hmm. he loves uh, decoys that somebody that was a decoy to him, and he hadn't seen him for a while. If he didn't have a sleeve on or anything, he just loves them. I mean, he wants to be with them all the time because that's the guy that brings him the most fun. So I did that. I'm actually I contacted uh, somebody a couple of days ago that was the the trainer, my friend. Jake moved to Colorado and started his own place. And I knew the last guy that was there, but I hadn't worked a dog since, since Clyde. And so I'm going to maybe in the next year, uh, pick out a male and test them and find this the right pup. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to see if I can get to a PSA one. Right. So if I get a PDC, I'd be happy with that. Right. <laughs> PDC is like uh, just the, the beginner obedience, whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, breed suitability test. And a PSA one is the first title. Uh, but my dog Clyde could have done it, but at the time I had just started a little business and I, uh, I was pretty busy doing that. I wasn't motivated. I was only motivated to do the fun stuff. I wasn't motivated to do the uh, obedience. Right. So this time I think I might, I have to get help because I'm not really a trainer. I haven't trained a dog seriously in years, mm-hmm. yeah, like 25 years. So, but I kind of know what to do, and uh, there's I know a lot of people that can help me out. So I, I like to do that before I hit 65. I'd like to have a PSA title dog right. that I do myself. So, right. but mainly the last eight years, I've uh, 
did everything I could to place dogs with hog hunters. And it's, it's been a challenge because some hog hunters are better than the others. Right. Some take care of their dogs better and some are more consistent. Uh-huh. And I had some hog hunters, young guys that were like, Hey, how's my dog doing? Oh man, I got a divorce or my girlfriend kicked me out and I had to sell all my dogs. And I'm like, Oh my God. So <laughs> now I got a bunch of guys that are pretty stable and, and yeah. they have dogs for me that are five and six years old that are, you know, work out good. Do they like the, the dogs that with, with a little color or is that? Uh, it's all, you know, it all changes. My dog, my friend Josh has a, a dog for me called, uh, uh, well, the first one he got for me, he calls Cassie. She was white with red. <laughs> and uh, I tended to give, I, I, when you produce heavy colored black like that, you produce red too because mm-hmm. it's recessive. Uh, and it, the black carries the red. Mm-hmm. And so red isn't really popular, you know. A lot of the American Bulldog people are like, oh, that looks like a boxer. Or, you know, if they have a little black on their muzzle, they're like, that dog has Mastiff in them. You know, they they don't understand color genetics. Mm-hmm. I've even had my dog Mayday, who's probably the most proven catch dog that I've ever produced. I used to have people say, that looks like a road featured rich pack. <laughs> so, I, you get all kinds of crazy things and rumors, and I'm kind of a jokey type of guy. I... You know, I, I hear something stupid and I just sarcastically say, you know, like there's rumors that I've crossed a, a greyhound into my dogs because my dogs are muscular and have tight hips. So if I get a dog, you know, somebody will say something. Oh, I won the sprint race with my dog. And I'll say, yep, that's a, that's a, the uh, greyhound I put in there. <laughs> yeah. And some people don't, I guess they don't understand that level of sarcasticness and, uh, like I have dogs now, uh, I have like three females that have been called Twiggy because I was told they were, the rumors are, oh yeah, he had a greyhound named Twiggy that he crossed into his dogs. And so I just made a joke of it. I, first one I had was Iron Twiggy and then I had Wrecking Twiggy <laughs> and now I have Twiggy Lou and now I ha- and then I have uh, a puppy that's called Terrible Twiggy. So <laughs> some people, you know, there's, I mean, there's people that swear by it. I sold dogs to people and we've become pretty good friends. People that have paid a lot of money for a certain color dog, you know, like a black dog or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've read all the stuff on the internet and now they're my friends that we talk, you know, sometimes two times a month. And uh, they'll, it's happened so many times. It's funny. I mean, it's just crazy. They'll say, you know what, man, I don't care if you put Greyhound or they'll, they'll say, oh, I don't care if you put Pitbull or whatever the rumor is. I don't care if you put that in there, man. My dog is incredible. Whatever you did, it helped the breed out, you know. And I'm like, I, I didn't do that, man. I, <laughs> there's no way I could put a pointy nose, bottle nose, dolphin headed, little tiny pin headed Greyhound in and get a bulldog, bulldoggy looking dog. And, no. and a lot of my dogs, they're, they're, uh, especially when they say I did it, uh, are super bully, like too bully. Mm-hmm. So, but it, it's the kind of thing I've learned when somebody says something negative about you, uh, people are so fast to believe it. It's law, man. They, they they have no doubt in their mind that it mm-hmm. could be a, you know, that's a lie. But if somebody says something good about you, eh, I don't know about that. You know, they, they're not going to accept that that quick. Something about human nature some kind of larceny people they believe they believe the worst quick uh, and they won't believe the best very well they right they don't believe that so i just after a while gave up it's like the more you try to defend yourself the more guilty you look right and there's there's people that come out every once in a while i get a little bit aggravated and maybe say something to them but to them it's you know, they, the rumor just keeps growing and growing. It's like, oh, yeah, they have videotapes of you. <laughs> you know, they have the DNA proof, which is a lie, a complete lie. Matter of fact, that dog, Suge, I was telling you about, these people here in St. Louis owned her. She championed out. She was an Iron Dog, uh, titled dog, and ranked, and all that stuff. And uh, they made such a big to-do. These All these people were making such a big to-do 
because she was real muscular mm-hmm. and and not as not as bully, but pretty bully. She champion out in, in in the NKC, so she she's not a she doesn't look like a greyhound by any chance. But she was a little more athletic than some of the bullier dogs, and uh, so everybody's like, oh, that dog. Well, they went and got uh, the wisdom panel, uh, what are they DNA profile thing because they made a they had a profile for American bulldogs and she came back a hundred percent American bulldog. So they placed that on the internet. Nobody cares. Nobody yeah. cares that they started saying that I somehow I manipulated the, this company. You know, I, I somehow manipulated their gene pool <laughs> to make it. I don't know. So it's just a crazy thing. The more you try to defend yourself, the, the more you look guilty. So, yeah. And it, in the long run, it used to really aggravate me because it's just trying to discount what I've done. And, uh, but in some ways, you know, some of the people that are like that, they're better off if they get a dog from somebody else. I'd rather not deal with them. That's a bad thing about American Bulldogs. They're just, I'm sure it's with any breeding dogs. You breed a litter for yourself and you can only keep, you know, usually one pup to carry on with. Well, you may have seven, eight, nine, ten more, and you got to place those dogs somewhere, sell them, or place them with somebody. So, I've I've avoided, I think, a lot of pretty wacky people. You know, the ones that uh, want a dog, they see, hey, I like what's in front of me. I like the record of what this guy's produced. Uh, they tend to be a little more practical. Whereas I've dealt with people in American Bulldogs that are. It's just unbelievable, crazy stuff. They lie to you about stuff. And I've had people tell me the dog has bad hips. <clears throat> and I ask them for an x-ray, and they send me an x-ray of something else, I guess. And then I find out four years later, uh, they just bred the crap out of that dog right. and produced dogs with great hips. So I had a guy in Puerto Rico do that to me. I, I replaced his dog and find out all these pedigrees now have that dog in it he just bred it and it was a lie it didn't have bad hips so some of it's lying and some of it's people you know a dog hurts their knee which can happen in a big big dog and bulldogs in general they they tear their knee tendon or something Mm -hmm. and so they favor that leg it's injured and but if you rest your dog for a while a lot of times scar tissue builds up on the tendon and and it kind of goes away and so I used to have vets that would say, yeah, oh, yeah, that dog had, you know, it hurt its back leg. And they'd say, oh, that dog has bad hips. And even some vets would take x-rays and then they'd send me the x-ray and say, yeah, this dog is severely dysplastic. And, well, I used to x-ray, I probably x-rayed three, 400 dogs mm-hmm. in 26 years. And the vet that does my pen hips is one of my best friends. So... We've seen a lot of dogs. So I just could walk into this house and with an x-ray or a, um, now they have them all on disc and show them. And we look at them and scratch our heads like, what's this vet talking about? These aren't good hips. These aren't bad. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, you know, so now I require uh, a pen hip, a real evaluation, not not just some vet telling. They think, oh, the, the hip's shallow. That means that it's dysplastic because that is actually the d- definition of hip dysplasia is a uh, bad hip confirmation, mm-hmm. which there's no there's no scientific proof, studies, nothing that shows that hip confirmation is what uh, causes uh, hip problems like mm-hmm. DJD, degenerative joint disease, or osteoarthritis. That's why I use pen hip. Pen hip measures the laxity of the hip joint. There's a tendon inside the hip, just like a doll's leg. And that rubber type tendon, uh, if the dog has a loose hip, if that tendon's loose, then the dog's hips are going to wear out sooner. If the hips are tight, uh, they don't, they may not ever have any kind of change. And they proved it, they proved it with the 14 year Purina study. There's been a bunch of studies done, but Purina did a study for 14 years. They took a colony of uh, Labradors and uh, they had one colony that was kept heavy and one colony that was kept trim. 
and they pen hipped and OFA'd every dog every year of its life, starting at, uh, well, they did a puppies at four months, and then they did them at a year, and every year of their life till they died. And they found dogs that, that had OFA good or fair. They didn't have any that were excellent, but any that are good or fair at two years of age, 55% of them went on to develop uh, osteoarthritis or DJD, degenerative joint disease that shows calcium deposits and wearing of the bone where it's, you know, wearing out. It's causing arthritis and pain. And the pen hip results, they go by a measurement. So the tighter the hip, the longer the dog can go before it has any kind of osteoarthritis. <clears throat> and the dogs that measured 0.3, around the 0.3 or tighter, uh, could live most of their life and never have any trouble. Mm -hmm. So it's a weird thing. It's been that way for 25 years. All the all these studies have been done. This place in New Jersey called the Seeing Eye Dog, they breed Jap Shepherds, Labradors, uh, Golden Retrievers for Seeing Eye Dogs, and they used that. <clears throat> this guy, Dr. Layton, I think his name was, he used it and pretty much eliminated. He said, I basically made a gene pool of tight, hipped German shepherds that never have any kind of trouble with the hips. Because with those dogs, it's a thousand of dollars and hours and hours of training. Mm -hmm. And then they got to work for so many years and it, you know, they can't be lame, but everybody still does the OFA cause it's cheaper. And, uh, vets pretty much barely, they don't have to go through any kind of training. They don't have to buy special equipment and, uh, it's just easier. It's only one or two x-rays and they send it in. <coughs> but that's the dog game. <laughs> so with, it's, uh, yeah. with the invention of genetic testing and, and all of that, uh, DNA testing, do you think it's people are relying too much on uh, unproven science and are losing out on some really good dogs well honestly i can only speak in what i see in american bulldogs mm -hmm. um, there's like i would say there's maybe four percent of the people that breed american bulldogs that do any genetic testing and i'd say probably 90 percent of the people that do it are just doing it because that's the thing to do they don't know what they don't really but like they do all these genetic testing, uh, they have like 150 things they look at. Yeah, you know, you see that all the time. People say, "Oh, my dog passed 150. He doesn't carry 150 of these genetic diseases." Well, those are things that American bulldogs don't carry anyway. They don't. They don't have it. It's not a problem. So they do have a couple things <clears throat> that show up, like the sickdiosis, uh, which is great. I, mean, I did. 20 years ago, I wasn't sure. There was no test. I mean, if it showed up, you just knew you had a dog that carried it. You kind of had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's another one that's pretty rare uh, called NCL. And uh, I, I only know, I've asked and asked, I've only known one common uh, ancestor that's in all the dogs that carry that. And now I think they, they have the test, and so they've eliminated a lot of that stuff. So that's worked out good. But it, it never affected my dogs because my dogs didn't have that dog in it. And uh, all the other stuff, I'm not so sure. Like I said, it's these are all tests that are for like a West, West Highland Terrier and all these breeds that have been, you know, 200 or 170 years of uh, dog shows have created uh, weird strange disorders in the dogs because uh, once again everybody has such a weird freaked out idea of what you know oh my dog's pure oh it's got to be pure you know the biggest sin that could ever happen is if somebody crossed a different breed in for whatever reason but genetically that's the problem people are like oh you shouldn't inbreed you know you shouldn't do this that's a problem breeders in breed no it's not the problem i mean the only people only breed that i know of that really in breeds like crazy are game game bred pit bull breeders and uh you can say what you want about game bred pit bulls but 
you can't kill one of those son of a bitches. <laughs> I mean, they're healthy as can be. They they can live 15 years, and they do amazing things. So the inbreeding isn't the reason. I mean, it can be a reason, just like outcrossing can be a reason, or line breeding can be a reason. The reason is you're breeding dogs that are junk, that, that have, you know, when you have a breed that was bred, the selection pressure is a coat color or a certain type of ear or a certain type of tail or whatever, you know, just, and they're, they have a closed gene pool. So you've, you've reduced the variability of the genes and you've locked in weird stuff and you could call it inbred or you could just call it the gene pool is destroyed. Whereas in the old days or in mother nature, who is the best breeder that ever lived, uh, they inbreed. I mean, Mother Nature. There's inbreeding. There's line breeding. There and there's outcrossing. But the number one thing is the selection pressure. The best, the best, healthiest, strongest is what breeds. And that's not what we select for in purebred dogs. We select for this dog has the look, the type. You know, people think type is purely the look of the dog. You know, that's all they care about, which breed type is actually everything. Like, uh, you know, a breed type for an American Bulldog should be a dog that can go in the woods, get along with other dogs, run up on a hog, grab it and hold it while the, the hunter dispatches it. Even if it's 80 degrees outside and even if it takes 15 minutes for the hunter to find the dog, uh, it's got to hold on and live. So if you got a dog that can't do that, then you really don't have an American Bulldog. It doesn't matter what the papers say. It doesn't matter how many ribbons somebody has or title, shits and titles or this title or that title. None of it matters. Like in the old days, uh, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, uh, you'd see a Bulldog that would be the top-notch Bulldog, whatever, when they did bull baiting. They may have a fluffy tail. It <laughs> may be a quarter collie. But... The task, the job, is what defined the breed. Now we have the opposite. The fluffy ears is what defines the breed, you know, or the wrinkles, or just these cosmetic things that have nothing to do with anything except some weird human uh, objective cosmetic thing they love. So, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Everybody's a visual creature. I mean, we try to marry the prettiest woman or most handsome guy and you know we're just hardwired for that but the problem is in dogs is it cuts down the genetic diversity and it only isolates nonsense nonsense genes and then on top of that everybody's so crazy like as if an irish setter that had one eighth uh of English setter or some other healthier breed in it to help uh, introduce better genes into the gene pool, like that would be an impure dog. That's a mongrel, you know, but a dog that's got garbage that's nuts, you know, or King Charles Spaniel that its brain is too big for its skull or something, whatever. But hey, it it has pure dogs in it. You know, it's, it's like a weird eugenics we wouldn't do that with humans you know we wouldn't say that with humans we wouldn't think about it that way or nobody even the biggest racist on earth wouldn't say you know well, we're pure we're this and that no you're we don't do it that way we don't breed that way so if you're breeding a dog for a job a working dog it's got to be able to do that job or you're really not breeding that breed you know if you bred a pointer that couldn't point you wouldn't have much of really a pointer if you if you bred a, a setter or a spaniel that couldn't flush a retrieved game or a Labrador that can't swim, uh, you may have a good-looking dog, but you don't really have that breed. So that's the kind of thinking people need to start getting uh, the mindset. And some of these breeds like Boxers and Dobermans and uh, you name it, almost every AKC breed, they're so unhealthy with these weird – you know, you can't get a Doberman nowadays – it doesn't have uh, von Wildebrand's disease or cardiomyopathy or all kinds of stuff. You can't get 
a lot of boxers that don't have major problems with cancer early on or epilepsy and and how do you save that it's not by having this weird attitude you need to introduce some healthy genes in there and you know reconstruct the breed a little bit because it's you know you're never going to outbreed that stuff you've created a monster like those bull Arabs that yeah. take a pointer and a yeah. bull terrier and yeah. a greyhound. And then you talk to some people, it's like, yeah, well, this guy got a collie in his or this. But they don't care. No. Nope. Like I said, you know, back in the day, there they had uh, uh, people of noble blood that had huge kennels. And they mm-hmm. had uh, some people that had sighthounds or hunting dogs. Mm-hmm. They, and they didn't care either. It was in, not really until uh, the Victorian days when they started doing these little dog shows. And then you, I don't know what it is about people. You get like a weird snooty thing. It's like, mm-hmm. my dog's pure. My dog's pure. Sure, what? It's a, your dog is a genetic yeah. wolf. Your right. dog is a freaking gray wolf. Yeah. All dogs are. Mm-hmm. That's it. You know, there's nothing pure outside of that. I mean, if you took a wolf and bred it to a cheetah or a, jackal or maybe that would be you know not pure wolf but uh well i mean a chihuahua has the same lineage you know basically as a great dane so all this idea of purity i don't know what it is i don't know what it is with people they're like no no this dog's pure it's like well nothing's pure every breed was created from some other breed so so if your breed is like unhealthy and you're creating dogs that suffer I mean, you know, physically suffer. If you really love a dog, you don't want a dog that overheats and dies. Yeah. Trust me. They, that is horrible. Their heart explodes. They're, they have aneurysms in their head because their organs are so heated up. So that's a horrible way to die. So for you to be, no, 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 I don't have it. There's In American Bulldogs, we have a lot of people. They're like, no, 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 there's no problem. My dogs don't have problems. Yeah, but your dog lives inside in air conditioning. Yeah and never does anything well the hog hunting's not you know well yeah no hog hunting's not for everybody i understand that but uh you know whatever the task is and this is true too i've found uh there's so many dogs that i placed out probably about i probably have about a third of the dogs make it and and two-thirds didn't make it you know they're just they're not cut out for it so they go to a pet home or whatever they didn't catch. They don't have the mind. They don't have the mental toughness. Mm-hmm. They, whatever you know, there's a lot of things they can't. They don't breathe good. You know that that could be a thing. Uh, that's another thing too. American bulldogs, like these hog hunters, they don't have a separate uh, vehicle to carry the catch dog. So your catch dogs got to get along with everybody. Yeah. They get it. They put them in a box yeah. together. Yeah. <clears throat> that was the biggest thing that freaked me out. And I find that the dogs that can do that work as a team, mm-hmm. catch a hog. I mean, when they, sometimes they're 10 minutes ahead of you because they use GPS to find these things. Yeah. And that dog, is it may be him and one other dog holding on to a 300-pound boar mm-hmm. or a, a female that's only 175 pounds, but she can she knows how to kill a dog. And they got to hold on to it, and that stress, they have to – calm down after it and chill out and go back in the box if they want to hunt another hog. So that I find that those dogs have the better temperaments. Right. Like a lot of those dogs, they come home and they play, you know, they're covered in blood and they play with the kids. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they're totally trustworthy. They're great with puppies. You know, it, it's, it's like uh, anything, you know, you, you, adversity shows character. And it really shows the temperament. I've had dogs, when I first started out, that I thought, this dog's got a great temperament. Oh, I love this dog. It's so wonderful. And then I take it to a show or do something with it that's a little stressful, that's out of the ordinary. And all of a sudden, this dog is like kind of weak-tempered. He doesn't recover really quick. Mm-hmm. you know. And that, that tells you something. So there's a lot of stuff that a dog show and even doing bite work. Because you know, when they do bite work, they take... The people that are real serious about it, these Malinois and stuff, they'll take them at five weeks, and they don't let them interact with anything except them, and they do rag work, and they do all this drive building, and they imprint all these things in their brain. And, uh, you know, like I've had people tell me, oh, 
why don't you start playing the radio and there's a you can get this reoccurring sound that has gunshots and sirens and all this stuff to desensitize your puppy to noise and it's like ah i mean that's i do enough work with these puppies i don't have time for that but to a point is that like conditioning or changing imprinting in their brain to to condition them to stimuli that would cover up what they would do if they you know what their natural temperament is basically Mm -hmm. so it's a it's a pretty fascinating thing i mean i'm not an expert on raising dogs or even breeding dogs but uh i see there's a lot of there's a whole lot of stuff whereas back in the day uh as cruel as it was i mean if you're a caveman and you had a dog that helped you bring down a deer or track a deer or hold a deer while you killed it uh you know it's the difference between eating and not eating so yeah. You know, if you had a dog that did it, but then tried to bite your kids when he got near the deer, yeah, that dog doesn't, that dog's not going to be good. So no. that's what created all the greatness in animal, in dogs, in mm-hmm. domestic animals. You know, the uh, a dog can, you know, some, there's a big difference. Some dogs are just incredible and some dogs are a little bit weird. <laughs> you know? Yeah, They're unhealthy or they're mentally soft and strange, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's, nobody thinks that way today. It's all about my dog's pure, my dog's pure, my dog's pure. So these American bullies, when they started coming out, I thought, well, I don't know. I guess these younger kids, I don't understand some of those dogs, but they're they're crossing everything. I mean, there's just no way you can take a show pit bull and breed it to microscopic bulldog size and then all the way up to 150 pounds or 175 pounds if you look at the hulk uh, without crossing a bunch of stuff in there but even those people are like you know no my dog's pure my dog's this my (laughs) dog's that yeah you know and uh even the dogs that aren't pure they're just breeding them on the wrong thing you know some of these dogs i'm sure if you're a dog person you've seen a lot of these just like bad science experiment looking dogs where it looks like their arms are growing out the side of their neck and their ass is three inches taller than their head and they just look like they're in pain they don't look like a creature from this earth Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's i I don't know i think if if the purebred dog is going to get rescued they need to change their mindset i'm not saying everybody should go out and fix the dogs on their own because you know but I think if they have a breed club and they have a select group of uh, breeders that work together, maybe everybody chips in to try to develop uh, a new strain that doesn't have a certain problem that they have. You know, like in boxers, I don't know. I don't know what they cross to, but they could figure out something they could cross into that would help the boxer. And then once they get to a certain point, after so many generations of testing the dogs, for not having that genetic problem, then that would be a viable strain. You know? So I think that's a good idea. I had a friend uh, in high school. Uh, she she had a dog. She had, I'm, she had an English bulldog. They called it Churchill because it was a looked like Winston Churchill. Yeah. But anyway, her mom was telling us about this dog, and I guess this was in the seventies. Yeah, would have been in the seventies, and she's telling us about this dog would follow the kids to the bus and sometimes it it sneak onto the bus and it would get underneath the seat so you couldn't pull it out yeah you know how short a squad of bulldog is yeah. so they deliver the kids to the school and then the bus driver would come back open the door and then she'd run out <laughs> you know into the thing and she said yeah and these people do nothing about dogs they just wanted a, a bulldog because it was cool and uh, she was talking about the neighbor's german shepherd got off his chain and he was a mean dog and and that uh, their little tiger, uh, Churchill, freaking, you know, manhandled this big German shepherd. And she said, we couldn't get him to let go of the German shepherd's throat. And uh, she said, my dad sat out there till the sun went down. And finally, the German uh, bulldog got tired and let go of the shepherd and it took off. <laughs> I was like, really? Yeah. That's incredible that that dog could do that in, in you know. Most of English bulldogs nowadays, if they exerted themselves that long, they may have the, the 
the nutty will to do it, but uh, they may overheat and die. You know, they'd have to let go because they, they couldn't take, you know, they, their oxygen would be cut off. I, I, 20 years ago, I was at a, a dog, outdoor dog show in, a, in a Dacula, Georgia. And uh, there was a guy with this little dog running around, mm -hmm. and it, it was the coolest little dog. It was only about 45 pounds. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, so I pulled this guy. It's a toothless hillbilly guy. Uh, he had a kennel called Gallant Farms. I can't remember his name now. I can't remember. So anyway, this dog's name was Jack Dempsey. And I was like, this is the coolest dog. It was August in, in Georgia. It was hot outside. And he's running all over the place, wagging his whole body. He was a tight, muscled little brindle dog with a bulldog head, mm -hmm. but tight, a tight little bulldog head. And so I'm like, God, that dog is so cool. And uh, I was talking to him. I said, you know, I watch the Westminster Kennel kind of Club dog show every year. And, you know, I love to see the English bulldogs, and I love to see the little tiny staffy bulls and mm -hmm. amstaff mm -hmm. and certain breed, you know, bull mastiffs. Those are the ones I like to see. And I said, I used to sit here watching it one year because, uh, uh, you know, I knew all about oldies and, you know, how they crossed American and English and bull mastiff and pit bull uh, back then. That was before all the big craze with oldies. But uh, I thought, wow, you know what? If I were to want to do create – a little English bulldog, a 50 pound English bulldog sour bug that is healthy. I, I would want to breed a little tiny staffy bull because staffy bulls in England are like the most popular breed. Mm -hmm. They're, they call them the nanny dog because they have such a good temperament. They're healthy. They don't overheat. Uh, they could do, you know, they could work as a ratter or anything. And they're kind of cobby and thick for a bull, a bull and terrier mm -hmm. type dog. So anyway, I told him, I said, yeah, I don't understand why you guys don't take a, an English bulldog female and breed it to a staffy bull. And he, he started smiling. He goes, that's what Jack Dempsey is. I said, really? He said, yeah, I took a, a staffy bull female and bred it to a 120 pound Hermes American bulldog. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, uh, or was that, I think that's what it was. I think he said he did that yeah. before. Uh -huh. And then, um, uh, so anyway, I was so intrigued with this little dog. I thought, man, I'd love to have a little breed like that. You know, it's a healthy, athletic mm -hmm. little bulldog, you know. And uh, so I'm like, would you ever want to sell him? He goes, no, no, never. He said, but I have a sister. I'll sell her. And I said, really? So he didn't live too far from there. He came and got her, and I bought her. And I, that's what I started doing. My I called them Alu Bulls. Uh -huh. And uh, so I had her... And I bred her to, uh, oh, what was the first one I bred her to? I bred her twice. Uh, oh, the first time I took her, because she, she looked like a bulldog, but she had kind of a thinner muzzle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she didn't, she kind of, she was a weird looking dog. She didn't look as good as her brother. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to breed her to an English bulldog. So I found an English bulldog in Southern Illinois that was, beautiful little show dog his head hit from the tip of his nose to his butt was so short he had such a short and he was 62 pounds he was a champion red and white beautiful dog so i bred her to him and i got three puppies i got one i sold as a pet it, it grew up to look like a flashy boxer red and white flashy boxer mm -hmm. i had one i called him rock because he he was brindle he had a little screw tail. He looked like a bulldog, but didn't have a short of a muzzle. But I call him Rock because he would literally just sit there all the time. He never did nothing. <laughs> and then I, I kept one. His name was Primo. And Primo was awesome. He was black, brindle, and white, and just crazy thick dog. Just beautiful. But he had a, link, a good link to his muzzle. Well, the that one, Rock, I had somebody knock on my door, and uh, he is years later, and I'm looking at him and he's like yeah i got a dog from you so oh, great great and i didn't recognize who he was and then he he i look and i saw his car and uh he opens the door and this dog comes out and i'm like what the hell it i thought what is this brindle rottweiler doing because it was big mm -hmm. it was like he was like 90 pounds and he looked like uh an english bulldog and a rottweiler mix or something mm -hmm. and i'm like who is this and then i looked in the back seat and i saw his daughter and i remembered her she was a little baby and she's deaf 
And so I'm like, oh, my God, this rock. I can't believe that's him. And uh, the one I kept, Primo, he was beautiful, but he got to be like 85 pounds. He had feet as big as a Neapolitan Mastiff, but he was only about 17 to 18 inches at the shoulder. He was massive, but he got eye entropia. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about, you know, how prevalent it is with English Bulldogs. Yeah. So I got the surgery done, and I had him neutered, and I put him in a pet home. And uh, But he was actually really cool. But my thing with them is I didn't want to produce a big dog. I wanted to produce a 50-pound, mm-hmm. you know, little dog like Jack Dempsey. And uh, so I did a, I did so many different Staffy Bull, English Bulldogs, straight-up, you know, breedings. I did small American Bulldogs with an, Amer- with an English. I got huge stuff. I got huge dogs out of that. And uh, so I got to the point where I got pretty close to what I wanted. I had a female I called Mona Lisa. And then I got divorced and moved out into the country. And uh, I don't know, I just wasn't, I, I had invested so much time and energy and money, I didn't want to give up. But I wasn't really passionate about it. Right. And uh, I produced some pretty cool looking dogs. I produced this dog called Creature. Uh, he was about 65 pounds and just the biggest head, the biggest bone you'd ever seen. He lived outside 24 seven. He wasn't a house dog at all and never had, never had trouble. Of course he wasn't a real drivey dog. So Mm -hmm. if it was really hot, he'd sit under the shade, you know, and he'd kick, you know, get drinks of cold water. So he wasn't a working dog, but Mm -hmm. for, he could survive no problem, you know? And I have one female left now. I have a couple that are pets with people. I have a couple males that I have out with my cousins and, and family members. And uh, I've got a female called tie dye. I actually, uh, I guess, I don't know how many, probably 10 years ago, my friend that lives up the street from me has this, uh, had this catahoula. It was a real heavy bone catahoula called jigsaw and a uh, really good dog, like good with the kids, not, not a typical catahoula. Most catahoulas are wacko, crazy, Mm -hmm. hyper. So I thought, I wonder what I would get if I did that breeding. It'd be cool to get that merle color. Yeah. So I did a breeding. I got uh, a dog. uh, I had two females from it. They kind of looked like a bulldog, but for a little bit, they almost looked like a a short, very short, muzzled uh, Australian cattle dog. Oh, awesome. (laughs) So I did another generation back to my bully dogs, and I got a female that looked like a old, nice oldie, but a very moderate oldie. And then I bred her to a dog I had called Camo, and that's where I got the one female I got left. I call her tie-dye. She's a tri-colored merle, and I think she's either four or five years old. I've never bred her. I, I need to breed her uh, for she, for long because i just i don't like to breed uh females once they get too old but right especially bulldogs but she lives outside you know she lives inside sometimes too but she's mainly outside she likes to be outside more than uh being in a crate in the house when i go to work so and my my friend chad has my dog rusty who is her dad or yeah no i guess it's her half brother and uh He's, I think he's seven, eight years old, and he he has an oldie from somebody else, and uh, you know they they do fine, they do great. They're not they're not like an American bulldog. They're not going to go out in the in the heat and work them, but they're for a pet what the original English bulldog, you know, Victorian bulldog, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. just a funny fat little clown to share your life with. Mm-hmm. They're great. Yeah, but, it, you know, breeding dogs, seriously, if you're, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of yeah. mess. Uh, yeah. I'm divorced. I live, <laughs> I live on my own. Occasionally, I have a fat girl that lives with me for a while. But <laughs> I usually get tired of all the dirt in my house and the yeah. nasty dogs. So it, it takes it takes a quite a commitment. I, I don't know. Sometimes I, I, I'm, people in my family tend to be, uh, kind of obsessive with hobbies you know I, my one brother he could tell you anything about hockey and sports my other brother can tell you anything about history you know but we tend to get these interests and 
move on to other interests and, you know, and then, I don't know why I've been doing this for 26 years and I, I still wake up every day thinking of ways to, to make that one dog that's just, uh, you know, super the best ever. Mm-hmm. So I, I know I can't be doing this forever because it takes a lot of physical, these American Bulldogs, they, they can fight, you know, they can get, uh, two of the wrong personalities together and they'll fight and I just know it at a 75, 80 year old guy I'm not going to fight